Okay, so welcome everybody. Welcome to this week's our seminar. Um, let me wish you all a happy Estonian Independence Day from Thailand. And um, if you're new, if you haven't come to one of these talks before, the way it works is um, Jorge is going to talk for 45 minutes, and afterwards he's, he will take some questions. Um, after the questions, I'll turn off the recording. So if you want to ask questions without being, being recorded, then that's also a possibility. And anyway. Jorge has, has agreed to stay a bit longer to, to discuss afterwards. Um, during the talk itself, if you would like to ask a question, please put your hand up using the raise hand feature of Zoom. And I will interu interrupt Jorge and you'll get to ask your question. But of course you'll be recorded. So you have to, you're implicitly giving, giving permission for us to record. Um, and I think that's that's all. And, and but we do encourage interactions. So please, if you're confused um, and you would like to ask a question, please please go ahead. Uh, so Jorge, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Pavel. And uh, I would like to start by thanking uh, Jamie, Alexander, Alexandra, and Pavel for uh, for the invitation. So it's been a while that I give a talk. So it's been, it's been a while that I don't give a talk. That at least that is not related to teaching. Um, so I, I appreciate very much the, the invitation and I look forward to, to interactions. So I am currently at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. And today we'll be talking about session types. And if you don't know what session types are, I will, I will talk about this. So I don't assume that you know session types and the interaction of session types with something that, uh, that I will call higher order concurrency. And I will explain what that, what that is. And this is joint work with a number of people. So this line of work, I have developed it together with uh, with Dimitris Kusapas, who is now in, a, in Cyprus with Nobuko Yoshida. And more recently, I, I have been developing the, this line of work with uh, with my PhD student, Alain Aslaganesh, and uh, former bachelor student, Eric Fox. So, I would like just to start by giving you some keywords. So, so the structure of my talk is roughly that uh, I'll tell you a number of results up to the first half of the talk. And then I, I, I go into a bit of details about what they actually mean, what they are. Uh, but I, I'm not very technical. So I would like just to keep things in, in, in a high level, let's say of understanding, hopefully. And, uh, but of course, if there are any questions or if there are any requests for, for more detailed material, then I will be happy. So uh, my own background is in concurrency theory. Yes, so uh, this informs many of the things that, uh, that I will be presenting today and informs many of the choices that I will, I will be discussing in, on, on our results. So this is the first keyword in the, that I would like to mention, concurrency theory and in particular models of concurrency that concern message passing programming or channel-based programming, if you could say. And this connects in, a, in an interesting way with programming languages, with uh, semantics and formal models of programming languages, and with the verification of programs. So this is, let's say, let's say the general overview of what I would like to, to talk about today. Um, I will be talking about type systems, or at least type systems play a main role in, 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 in the results that I will present today even though I won't go into the strict details of the type system. So they are very well-known slogan in this, in this uh, when, when you hear about type systems is, is Milner's fable slogan that well-type programs can't go wrong, right? And this is uh, a mainstream technology already for in, in enforcing uh, program correctness, or at least some basic notions of correctness in programs, even more sophisticated, right? I, I, talk, a, I, talk, uh, I talk a lot about process calculi, and a very common slogan here is that uh, the pi calculus, which is a well-known calculus of uh, interaction and concurrency, treats processes much like the lambda calculus treats functions. So this is the well-known, let's say, slogan, and sometimes it has been abused a bit, but it's, it, it, it draws a clear analogy between the pi calculus as a model of concurrency and the lambda calculus as a model of, uh, of sequential computation. And the talk will talk about, indeed, uh, merging the pi calculus and the lambda calculus. As the title suggests, I will be talking about session types and session types as a mechanism for enforcing communication correctness in programs, right? There is no big slogan here, but essentially you can describe a session type as a mechanism, as an abstraction that allows you to say what 
you should be sending through a channel, what you should be receiving through a channel, and when those exchanges should take place, right? So as we will see later, uh, unlike, uh, let's say, simple typing structures, in session types, we have uh, the possibility of, of, uh, of describing the structure of a protocol with the, the, the whole history of, uh, of what the, we should be exchanged through a channel in a program. And the last thing I should introduce is the notion of relative expressiveness. And relative expressiveness concerns results that tell you whether one programming model is more expressive than another. And, um, and I will be focusing on programming calculi or in calculi for, for, for programming models in which these comparisons of relative expressiveness are framed in terms of, uh, of types. So they use types as, a, as an essential ingredient in order to compare different models, right? So this is this is essentially the the big overview of uh, of, of keywords and slogans that I will would like to start with. I tell you immediately what the what the main results are about. So I would like to to introduce uh, or to overview actually uh, a number of results that allow allow us to bridge the notions of functions, on functional programming, and concurrency. Okay, so this is not a new direction. There is a lot of work. Uh, I think, for instance, in the late 80s, early 90s, about uh, combinations of the lambda calculus and the pi calculus in order to actually provide foundations for uh, programming languages in which the functional paradigms, the concurrent paradigms are seamlessly integrated, right? So those bridges I'm, uh, I, will refer, I will be referring here are essentially encodings. So you can think of an encoding as a formal compiler between two different Calcula. In this case, you can think of them as language translations. So they allow you to translate one term in one language into another term, hopefully uh, a term that makes sense, a term that, that preserves the behavior into another language, right? So I think of, uh, of encodings as bridges between different models. The encodings that I have in mind here that I will be discussing here are going to be informed by session types. And informed here means that session types, the protocols that session types represent are going to guide the definitions of the encodings are going to be essential to prove the correctness of the encodings. And as we will see linearity or the ability or the, the property of ex executing certain actions exactly once is going to be key in order to enforce optimizations. And linearity is a, is a key ingredient to session types. So essentially the, the, the whole ingredients or the, the basic ingredients of, uh, of session types are going to be informing the design of the encodings. And of course, types also play a role, as I, as I mentioned in, 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 the, in, the, in the process of, uh, of proving the correctness of those encodings, the proving the correctness that, uh, of, of, of these formal compilers. And uh, correctness here will mean to, the, we refer to the, to the preservation of behavior, to a, uh, certain other properties like that have to do with, uh, with how an encoded term relates to a source term and typing equivalences actually that, that help us to, to, to bridge the gap. So in some cases, I will be presenting extensions of known encodings, which are now going to include types, session types. They're now going to include the information that processes are executing protocols. And I will also mention a new encoding that is not present in a, that is not possible, or at least it has not been formalized for, for calculi without types. And that an encoding that becomes possible actually because now we have extra information in the form of protocols. Okay. So this is, this is uh, in, in two slides what I will be talking about today. I would like to go a bit uh, more detail in terms of the context. A great deal of motivation of what we do it has to do with correctness of programs. And uh, I think that most of you will agree with me that uh, in the sequential world, this is a notion that is well understood. So we have uh, programs that run in a single machine and uh, we have that a program could, can, could be considered as correct if it produces outputs that are consistent with some input, right? So this is the, the, the standard input output vision of, uh, of program correctness. In a concurrent message passing world, this is a different, there is a, uh, there is a different setting, right? Because we don't have a, any longer single computer that execute them. So every, all the pieces of your program, you have a distributed setting in which you have uh, processes running in different machines, possibly spread out throughout the world and they're exchanging messages. 
So an input output notion of correctness is not really appropriate in this case. What I will say is that in this case, in the, in the case of concurrent programs that exchange messages in order to coordinate their operation, correctness amounts to essentially uh, conformance or conformance with respect to some intended protocol, right? So we'll say that the program is correct or that distributed programs are correct, interacting programs are correct if they always respect the intended protocols, right? So this is, of course, a very simplistic view of what's going on in a, in a message passing setting, right? Of course, we could have a, a more interesting scenario in which we have a multi-party communication in which more than two parties are, are, uh, are interested in, in coordinating with, with, with each other. And the sequentiality in the, in the order in which these messages are sent and received is going to be crucial to determine overall system correctness, right? Um, good, so now I would like to talk about type systems and I would like to, to set the scene for session types. So in the sequential world for sequential languages, uh, we have of course a, a well, let's say a well-known tradition of type systems. And uh, here in, in, in this case, we talk about data type systems in which the type system serves, helps you to classify values in a program, right? So of course there, are, there, are, there, is a, there is a whole world of types in system for sequential languages. I, I don't want to sound reductionistic, but the, the idea here is that we are, we're considering about classifying values, right? And then we have things like, well, of course, simple things like uh, integers, strings of characters, this sort of, uh, this sort of classification. I'm interested in, 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 in this definition of classifying values in a program because what we will have in a message passing setting with concurrency is that the class of behavioral type systems, which is the, the, the kinds of type system that we need in order to enforce correctness, as I was mentioning before, these type systems are going to classify protocols in a program. So we are no longer interested in, in specific values, but we're interested actually in, in, in um, or actually type systems are going to be interested in enforcing the fact that channels uh, behave in a certain way that is consistent with intended protocol. Right, and by a protocol, I have I have in mind something as simple as a, as the following: like, like a, on a channel, you would like first to send a username, then receive some boolean, and after that, you would like to close. This is a very simplistic view of a protocol, but it already gives you the idea that you would like to classify something that goes beyond values. You would like to classify the behavior of what a channel is supposed to do. So you would like to classify the protocols, the different protocols that are in, in which a program may be involved. And a typical bug in this case is, is of course, the fact that uh, in a concurrent setting in which you have multiple threads sending and receiving messages, there is a, a substantial risk for messages to be sent and received in the wrong order, or there is also the risk in which you send a message that is never received on the other side, uh, or there are uh, program components that which are infinitely often waiting for a, for a message that will never arrive, right? So, so we have this, this kind of, uh, errors that have to do with protocol conformance in the sense that I was describing before. Good. So I will talk about session types as a specific instance of behavioral type system. So we like to, to think about session types as a way of classifying the protocols that a program should perform or that the channels in a program should perform. So the idea of session types is that uh, they are an abstraction of protocols because they help you to uniformly describe them in terms of, uh, of communication actions like input output in the, in the possibility of performing choices, offering a choice or offering a number of alternatives or making a selection among one of those alternatives. Session types are particularly unique in their support of sequential composition. The fact that you, you, may, you may be interested in making an, uh, in performing an input and output and after that you would like to do some other piece of your protocol, right? Sequential composition, of course, is something that has a very long tradition in the field of process algebra and process calculi. And, uh, and session types essentially uh, borrow this, uh, this kind of formalization of, uh, of prefixing and use, uh, use prefixing to express the, the, the structure of, of the intended structure of a protocol, right? In session types, we also have recursion as a way of expressing protocols that should, that should be repeated and that may be infinitely executed. And the intention here is that you will describe your protocol as a session type and you will ascribe that specification to some interaction device. So this is a, something, a, a very vague term that uh, 
that refers to things like names in the pi calculus or channels in the pi calculus, but also you, you may think of it as a, for instance, the endpoints that you may have in, in your services. You may think about the channels that you have in some specific programming languages. You, have, you may have a, you may have different different essentially mechanisms to which you will attach a protocol, to which you will attach a session type. And in the setting of the pi calculus or in the setting of, of, of process calculus, which is the, the, the main, let's say, framework in which I, I will be considering them, considering session types today, sequentiality in types as allowed by, by session types goes conveniently hand in hand with sequentiality in processes, right? So. Historically speaking, you, you may think about the, the pi calculus introduced in the early 90s, and shortly after, uh, typing disciplines for the pi calculus were introduced. And, and it's natural to think that the mechanism that, uh, that is so natural to have in the pi calculus also appears at the level of session types. And it's very inconvenient, as, as I mentioned, the, the idea of sequentiality, because it allows you to express uh, complex structures in, uh, in your protocols. Good, so this is the syntax of session types. So one can uh, already have an idea of what session types are without thinking about specific uh, target language, but thinking about the, 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 the typing structure in, the, in itself, right? So this is, this is the typical notation for a session type that outputs, and this is what this exclamation mark is supposed to mean. So this is an output of a session type. So sorry, an output of a, of a, of a value of type U. Okay, and for the moment, I'm not saying what U is. It's it's a it's a category of uh, of values, right? It will output a, a value of type U, and after that, and this is the sequentiality I was referring to before. You we will we will continue as, as the protocol described by S. Okay, another class of session type is the one in which you first input a value of type U, and after that, you continue as the channel as as the protocol S. This type here denotes the, the possibility of offering a selection between alternative behaviors. And this is going to be indexed by this finite set i. And you essentially give a label to each one of these behaviors and you expect that by communicating this label, then a process may be able to select one of those options. And so this is the, this is the ability of offering one selection or offering one alternative. And this type here is going to be ascribed to the to the channel to the endpoint that is able to select one of them, right? So you can immediately see that well, there is a there is a, a complementarity between output and input, offering a selection and making performing a selection. Okay, so this is a key idea in the in the in the in theories of session types, the, the idea of duality, the idea that uh, if uh, if I'm considering two separate endpoints of the same channel, they should be dual, they should be complementary at all times. We also have uh, ways of expressing recursion. So we have, this is a recursive type in which we will expect that this type S mentions some, in some point, uh, the recursive variable T. And this is the terminated protocol, right? So uh, this is the basic syntax. So I think that most work on session types can relate or, or use this syntax in some form or shape. Uh, Sometimes the difference is what U represents, right? Sometimes uh, U is, is meant to represent only basic values like, uh, like integers. Uh, but in the more interesting case, uh, U may also account for sessions themselves. So for instance, in this case, in such a case, it will mean that you output a reference to a session as a precondition or, as, as, as be, or before performing some other protocol. And if you think about it, the, the idea of, of outputting a reference to a session is something that comes out very natural in the context of the pi calculus. And in that case, you talk about delegation, the, the, the phenomenon or, or, or the ability of, of sending around or distributing a, a session to another participant. Sometimes it's also called high order session communication. I prefer to call it delegation, but but uh, but it, it's it's something that it's, it, it 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 comes with a, a great deal of uh, of expressiveness. The other thing that I would like to mention here is that is that even though we are interested in thinking about message passing processes that which are running concurrently or simultaneously, the protocols are sequential, right? So we have sequentiality here in output input, which is embedded also in the other operators. But there is nothing like a built-in concurrency operator at the level of types. Good. So 
one may think about session types, of course, as the type system or the type structure with properties and uh, uh, with defining characteristics. But we, one may also think about session types as defined in a model of concurrency. So we, we may think about session types as, uh, as defining something that we may call session-based concurrency. And, uh, and we can recognize two phases in, in or two different, uh, let's say, moments of computation in, in, in session-based concurrency. In the first phase, uh, we, we can imagine services like communicating services, like web services, advertising session protocols, advertising the kind of interfaces that they are able to support. And they do that through so-called channel names, right? And the idea is that different services wishing to communicate or to contact with each other, they will realize agreements to actually interact and while they realize these agreements, these, this kind of communication will proceed in an unrestricted and non-deterministic way, right? So that at the beginning, when, when the different services don't know exactly with which other services they will communicate, they, they can pick or they can drop services and they can, or they can discard alternatives. Once these services have reached an agreement, then uh, the service itself, the, pro the protocol itself that, 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 uh, that is of interest for those services will proceed along another class of names, which are called session names. So once the services has been realized, has, once the services have interacted, the, everything that, have to do, that has to do with the protocol will proceed in a linear and deterministic way, right? So once after the, the chaos, as to speak, of service agreement is realized, then the complementary parts will, will interact in a linear and deterministic way, right? So there is a big distinction between these two phases. And of course, what I'm talking here about about linear linear behavior or unrestricted behavior is in the sense of uh, of linear logic, right? So what what we would expect is that after service agreement, messages are sent and received exactly once, and and the order of of, of and the execution will proceed in a deterministic way. Okay. Now. Coming on coming out again to the to the whole point of uh, of behavioral type system, so. It turns out that there are many type systems, so you, 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 you won't find a canonical behavioral type system. There are many different proposals. And, uh, and I, I, I will say that one of the main reasons is that uh, actually identifying a proper notion of correctness uh, by means of different behavioral properties is not so easy. So correctness in this setting, or at least in the setting that I was motivating at the beginning, comes out from different formal properties. Uh, I will say that they are, the following three are the most relevant. So first is fidelity, the fact that processor or, 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 or interacting agents uh, respect the protocol, right? Another property is called communication safety and, it, and actually it's, uh, it's, it has to do, it's quite, quite related to, to, to fidelity in the sense that you wouldn't like to, to communicate, uh, for instance, values with the wrong payload. Uh, and another property is that of freedom and is the ability that processes engaged in a, in a protocol never get stuck. They never get, let's say, infinitely waiting for somebody else's, uh, for somebody else's message or input, for instance, right? And so we find actually in general, very different type systems with different properties and that use different insights in order to uh, enforce the different manifestations of, 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 pro, of correctness in, in, this, in this message passing setting. And something that may occur in particular is that a program can be both correct and incorrect in the sense that depending on, on the degree of precision or on the degree of accuracy of a, of, of, a, of a certain type system. So it could be, a program could be rejected as incorrect by a very stringent type system, but it could be, it could be admitted as correct by other type system that is less stringent that could have different properties, right? So of course, at, at what happens at the moment is that we have many different tools for several for seemingly related problems, and we still need to come to terms what uh, what the the properties and the relationship between these different type systems is. So in general, most of my research is informed by this idea of let's try to put some order or to try to understand the different connections between these different type systems. So or insight is essentially to try to connect very different type systems, including session types, by relating the languages on which these type systems operate, right? So we look at expressiveness as a way of, of opening the door to, to meaningful and rigorous connections between different type systems, right? So 
what are the goals here in, in terms of when you talk about relative expressiveness? Well, it has to do with encodings, with encodability results. We are interested in compilers between two concurrent languages, which in this case are going to have types. And we're going to be interested in, in making sure that they have, that the compiler makes sense, but also satisfies some, some, some concrete correctness properties. The other direction that one, one may be interested in is a separation result, which is essentially a proof that a compiler that I'm encoding between two type languages does not exist, right? And this is, a, I think, a particularly interesting way of, uh, of trying to, to establish connections between different typed process languages. And this is interesting also because it's a general approach, so this is something that we can adapt, we can, we can conceive for many different languages. It's a rigorous tool. It, we can actually come up with theorems and results that certify the connection between the type languages. It's flexible because, of course, we have, we have, of course, the, the uh, in our hands what correctness means in a specific setting. What is the, what are the properties that uh, that determine the correctness of the of the compiler of the encoding? And it's also practical in the sense that by connecting different languages, we have the possibility, in principle, to connect to to more pro to more uh, pragmatic modes, uh, models of programming. So we can connect, we can bridge the gap between process calculi and actual programming languages, right? Good. Uh, now let's let's now that I have talked about uh, session types and, and the idea of relative expressiveness, I would like to focus a bit on the idea of higher order concurrency. And I understand higher order concurrency from the point of view of process calculi. Right, so these are process calculi in which values can contain processes, right? So you, you, you have uh, these process languages in which interaction typically occurs in a point-to-point -point way, and these interactions entail the, the, the exchange of a value, which may refer to a process itself. And historically speaking, these, these higher order process calculus have, uh, have provided a natural and very promising and very productive bridge between the, the, the lambda calculus and process calculus, right? So a key example in this, in this, in this setting is, is, the, is, higher, is the higher order pi calculus. And when we talk about the higher order pi calculus, I, I, I have the feeling that what most people think about is uh, it's St. George's results about, about the higher order pi calculus, right? And, um, and this, this is a, a very well-known result, at least in, in the world of process calculi. Uh, and the result is it's, it's, it's quite intuitive. It says that if you are interested in something like the higher order pi calculus in which you can communicate processes, then you can compile, compile the, this ability of process passing to an, a language in which you don't have process passing, but you have name passing. And the intention is that instead of communicating a process in, in, its, in its complexity, instead of doing that, you will communicate a reference to that process that you, will, you may activate later, okay? So this is a very well-known result. It also stands in a very intuitive basis. And what Sanjuri did uh, back then was essentially formalizing this re representability result as an encoding and an encoding that is fully abstract with respect to bar congruence. And this is a, a way of saying that this is a very strong encoding with very strong properties because bar congruence is the notion of contextual equivalence one is typically interested in when concerning, when studying the process calculus. And in my, in my opinion, what this result, apart from the fact of being an interesting result, a, a very substantial result that, that, uh, that occurred back then in, in that moment when, when people were investigating combinations of the lambda calculus with the pi calculus, in my opinion, this result actually highlighted a lot the significance of the pi calculus because then it allowed you to it allowed people to to understand or to focus on the pi calculus because you 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 could let's say let go the higher order setting because they could be represented in the pi calculus. Another benefit of this result or another important uh, uh, consequence of it is that reasoning techniques for the pi calculus could be transferred to reason about uh, the lambda calculus and to reason about the high order pi calculus. So it's, it's, let's say it's, it's, a, it's a result that is intuitive, it's strong, it's significant, and it has different applications. Now, this talk is, is about make, mixing all these, the, the idea of session, session-based concurrency, the idea of, uh, of, of high order concurrency. And I would like to introduce what I mean by this by using an example. So consider here 
these are three vertical lines and they are they, they will describe a protocol between three parties a client and two hotels hotel a and hotel b and what this client does is essentially to try to get some quotes from hotels by sending some little code right so instead of uh, of asking directly a question this client is a bit it's a bit different and it will it would send two different pieces of code so the client first sent an abstraction so this is a this is going to be my notation for an abstraction this is a function from names to processes so this is a process this is the usual abstraction notation right so you can think of this as a function from names to processes one to goes to hotel a the other goes to hotel b and the idea is that the client will like local interactions with the hotels so that's why uh, they send these codes right so running locally in hotel a then there will be an exchange between the client represented by by its abstraction and the hotel so we will have essentially the same behavior between the, the client and the hotel after that you will like the two clients to interact and to and to decide which code quote is the most convenient for for the client and based on that on that exchange then they are going to accept one of the quotes and they are going to reject the other okay so uh, so the scenario is is relatively simple you send some code so you you really depend on the ability of sending some program some process some abstraction in this case and then this, these abstractions are going to be equipped in such a way that they are going to interact with each other in order to complete the protocol right good so at the end what we would like is that for instance hotel a is is selected so one of the one of the hotels is selected because it has the most convenient code and the other code is going to be rejected okay so if you think about or if we think about the the, the kind of, of process language required to to model this kind of interaction then we can think about two alternative sources we can think about equipping things like um, like the, the higher order pi calculus with session communication with the, with the constructs with the process constructs that are typical of session types so for instance session establishment and the, as in the first phase that i described but uh, also a constructs for input and output of label choice so this is one way to go another way to go is essentially to take a session pi calculus so a pi calculus with sessions and then to add the, the possibility of exchanging abstractions exchanging these functions from names to pro from, from functions from names to processes right so we can think of um, of uh, of the languages that i will be presenting today as, as as coming from two different parts from two different points in the in in, in this whole design space of process calculi so imagine that i take the second path so i consider pi calculus with sessions and i wouldn't like to overwhelm you with with a uh, with a lot of, of notation so i will start from from the basics right so these are you, you can concentrate on this bit and on the syntax of processes so this is a process that inputs something along a name u and then after that it will continue spinning this is a process that outputs something outputs a value v and after that it continues as p so this is input and output prefixes this is label choice and it looks very similar to the session types if you if you remember right so this is a process that that on channel u it's ready to receive one of these labels and these labels are going to indicate one of the options selected by a client okay and this client selects options with this kind of construct then we have recursion we have parallel composition restriction and inaction when talking about the values here in, in a pi calculus the only value that we have available is a name and a name can come can refer to either shared names and these a b are going to represent the, the kind of names that we use for the first phase of session based concurrency in which the behavior is uh, is unrestricted and, and non-deterministic and the other kind of names that we're going to to use here are going to called linear names right or session names in which you have things like this so you have s and you have this over bar s which represents the fact that this s these two are going to be the the, the two endpoints of the same channel so you have a, a notion of duality on, on on channels that allow you to to identify the second phase of session based concurrency which is meant to be linear and deterministic okay so this is a session pi calculus uh, not particularly different from from any of the proposals that you you could find in, lit, in the literature so what we're going to do in order to to get to to higher order concurrency is essentially to add the ability of uh, of communicating abstractions 
right? So what, we, what we're going to do is going to enrich a bit our syntax of values, right? So what we add is the, the ability of passing abstractions and on, on, at the level of values. And at the level of processes, we are going to allow for application, right? So here again, this takes into, fact that, in, into account the fact that this is not an arbitrary application. We apply a name to, a, to an abstraction in order to get another process, okay? And this, this, will be, this will be, let's say, a, a quite conservative way of, of defining a, a higher order pi calculus with session, which in the purposes of this talk is going to call, is going, I'm going to call it H O pi, okay? And, uh, and the semantics is, is, is particularly as, as expected. So this, this is, there is a reduction semantics, at least uh, in, in the most basic terms, you have a reduction semantics in which you formalize the application of a name to an abstraction, you formalize the synchronization on a certain name. And here you can see the role of these overbar on names that I was mentioning before. So I'm outputting something on the channel N and concurrently I'm, in, I'm expecting something on N on this other thread. There is this overbar to telling me that these two names are, are make part of the same channel. And there is a, there's going to be a synchronization and this is going to represent the the mechanism for, for label choices. Good. Uh, so this is this is the basic language, right? We can represent uh, the two clients of my example in, uh, in different ways. So I'm going to give you two implementations. I'm not going to go too much into, into the details. I, this is just to, this is meant to, to convince you that, uh, that our language is, has some, some decent expressiveness, right? So you can write interesting things with it. So this is a client in which you have, um, uh, you you send two different codes, right? So you have this is an abstraction. So actually, this is the same abstraction sent first on session one and then on session two. So we have two different sessions, one per hotel, and we have the same code represented by this blue bit, and we're going to instantiate it with a different name. So there's going to be a free name on on this abstraction, and I'm going to instantiate it in different ways in order to to interact with different hotels. Right, so the idea is that you will send this code and then when the codes are run in the, in, on the side of the hotel, then you will expect some input on H1 and H2. So these are the codes from hotel one and hotel two. Then you make a comparison and depending on, on, the, on the quotes, then you will accept one code and reject the other. So this is essentially an implementation of, uh, of the protocol I was telling you before, right? There is another client in which essentially what I will do is to send two different codes unlike in my first example. And I'm going to give them uh, the, the, the two endpoints of the same channel. So this is H here, and this is over bar H, which means that H and over bar H are going to be dual. They are going to be able to communicate. And I'm not going to go into the details, but this is essentially a different way of implementing the same protocol. You will send those codes using session one and session two to the different hotels. And and this this will uh, and it's not too easy to become not to not to be difficult to to be convinced that actually this does what it's supposed to do. Good. So what are the session types for this kind of language in which I have not only name passing but I also have um, the the ability of passing abstractions, passing functions from names to processes. So I have essentially the same discipline I had before even though here I think I, I have mistaken the symbol. I have a semicolon instead of a dot. Anyway, this is, this is, the, this is something minor. Then I, when it comes to value types, I'm going to have types for channels because I have the ability of passing names, but I'm also going to have this category L that will allow me to talk about passing of abstractions. Okay, so this is, so the, the ability of passing an abstraction is, is represented at the level of session types in this category L. It comes from T flavor, so we have functions which are shared, okay? And these are functions that cannot contain any name. Let's say that their body cannot contain any linear name because they, they, are, they could be re, uh, executed multiple types or multiple times or several times. And we also have these linear functional types in which, uh, which we are interested in executing precisely once. Okay, at the level of channels, we have sessions. So sessions can be, can be, can be channels. And we also have this notation here for denoting shared name. So this is a shared session name and this is a shared functional value. Okay, so this is, these are going to, to be the session types that we're going to need for this particular language. 
we're going to have some some judgments and then we distinguish between values and processes but i won't go too much into the details of the type system itself then we can type the, one of the clients that, the, that that i showed before we can type and this is going to be a session type that is going to be attached to this process p of x x p of x y that that implements the communication with the hotel right and the idea is that the one of these codes will send a, the description of a room then it, it will receive a quote and after that they will make a selection right and the idea is that we will have to have we we'll like to have one typing for this abstraction right so this is going to be a linear function that accepts a name that implements this behavior this protocol and using this then we're going to be able to type the client right so we're going to have two different sessions s1 for interacting with the first hotel and s2 with the interactive to interact with the second hotel. Okay, so this is just a very brief illustration of how types and the typing judgment look for this example. Good. Very hard head. Can I interrupt you for one second? Yes. Um, kind of running a little bit out of time. So maybe try and wrap up in the next five minutes or so. Absolutely. So that's why I meant by I'm going to I'm going to tell you the the results that we got, and uh, probably we can come on, discuss a bit more after the after that. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I will leave some time for questions as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, the kind of questions that we had in mind here is well, we, you have this language, you have both name passing and abstraction passing, and the the, the obvious question is, do you need both? Or is is one of them fundamental uh, instead of the other? Can we represent one using the other? This is the main question at the level of of, uh, of processes, right? At least if you if you look at, um, at at our syntax here, right? So do you need both names and abstractions in the same language? And the other question is what what do you actually need from session types, right? So uh, how does this compare with 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 a with a with a more standard behavioral type system, which there is no connection, uh, there is no sequencing at the level of types. So these are the actual the, the actual questions that we have studied. So we, we have considered the language that I showed you before, and we identified two sub-languages. The first sub-language is called HO, and essentially it's a, it's a sub-language in which there is no name passing. So this you only have abstraction passing. The other language is, as you will expect, is called PI, which is a session PI calculus in which there is no abstraction passing. So in HO, you all only have abstraction passing, and in PI, you have the other half of it. You have name passing. The other thing that we have studied is a variant of HO in which you have a different session type system in which there is no sequentiality at the level of types. So this is actually closer to the more standard type systems in which a type will tell you essentially the payload value for a specific, a specific channel, right? And we can not we can easily essentially dissect uh, the HO pi in order to to obtain this sub, this sub language, right? So HO is going to be the language in which we remove all the elements related to to name passing. So we remove the ability of passing names as values, and we also remove recursion. Okay. In in pi, we are going to remove all these constructs that have to do with abstraction passing. So we remove this application construct, we, re we remove the abstractions from the syntax of values. Um, a similar dissection takes place at the level of type. So we remove things that have to do with, a, with, a, with name passing from the for, for the type, session types for HO and the things that have to do with name passing from the type system for PI. We also have this idea of minimal session types which is a, a minimal syntax for in which we have the trivial forms of sequentiality for protocols. So actually, we just for the just to keep consistency with the previous notation, we essentially we only have these kind of protocols for output. So a channel can either output or, or input something, but it has no continuation, it has no protocol afterwards. Right? So we remove the ability of, of doing a protocol after an input or, or output action, and we add the ability of sending lists of a list of values in each exchange. So the results that, that, that we have that, that, I, that we have for these different sub languages are essentially the following. First, we can encode the full language into the first order sub language, right? So we can encode HO pi into pi. 
And this encoding is, um, is essentially a refinement of St. George's representability result with session types. So the idea is that since now we have a description of channels as being shared or linear, we can exploit that information when coming up with references that will mimic the, 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 the passing of an abstraction, okay? The second result is on the concerning a show. So we can encode the full language in a language that only has abstraction passing, right? And this comes with two essential uh, obstacles or challenges. First, we need to find a way of, 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 uh, of mimicking name passing using abstraction passing, right? But we also need to find a way of mimicking recursion as we have it in HOPI in a language that does not have recursion. And the, the answer to, to that question is essentially recursive types. We are going to push recursion to the level of types. And as far as we know, this is a new encoding. So the, the idea of passing names, of, of mimicking the passing of names using passing of abstraction is going to be, is going to be new at least as, as far as we know. And, uh, and it's going to be enabled by the, by the fact that we have extra information that is given by session types. Therefore, this, these two sublanguages are going to be equally expressive, right? So we can, because, because of this uh, sequence of encodings, by the way, this line here indicates that this is a sublanguage of, of HOPI, this is another sublanguage. When it comes to, to, to minimal session types, we prove that essentially you can represent HO with abstraction passing and standard session types into an HO in which the session types don't have sequentiality. And we find that this is a way of explaining session types in terms of themselves. So do we have a way of explaining the sequentiality at the level of type that is so convenient when representing protocols, but it's in general absent from programming languages, we can express, express that in a typing structure that lacks sequentiality. So we know how to, how to represent this, okay? And, uh, and there is another part of this hierarchy. So this is a whole hierarchy of languages. It go, goes upwards because there are extensions of the language with higher order abstractions in which you can apply processes to, uh, you, you have functions from processes to processes more generally. We also have polyadic communications and we have the combination of these two features and HOPI is going to be able to, to, to encode all of this. So, what I, what I wanted to tell you in this talk, essentially I, 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 I did it in two parts. So I wanted to, to pitch you this kind of results and to tell you why this is interesting and what are the consequences, right? So what I will be very happy to discuss in the, in the question part is essentially the details of this a bit, right? Of, of, the, three, of, the, of the three, let's say results that I presented. There are many other different results that we have obtained in, 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 in the meantime. So we have formally speaking a notion of precise encodings, which allows us to bridge these different languages with types. We have notions of behavioral equivalences because we need to formalize correctness of encodings and we do that with typed behavioral equivalences. We have of course other encodings for the, for, as, I, as I have already mentioned. We have also an, uh, a negative result, a separation result saying that session names by themselves because they are linear, they cannot encode shared communication, right? And we also have a comparison in terms of uh, in terms of yet another forms of encoding, another definition of encoding between the two sublanguages PI and HO. And essentially what we concluded that HO, it's a, it's, it's a tighter encoding, it's, it's kind of better encoding. So that's why it makes sense to study minimal session types for this HO sublanguage here. So uh, I think I could stop here. Uh, I have essentially pitched the kind of results that I wanted to pitch. And consider also that, it, that, it, that it's meant for a broad audience. So if there are any questions or requests for more details on this, I will be ha happy to, to discuss now. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Jorge. But first, uh, before we go to questions, I'm just going to ask everybody to unmute so um, we can thank the speaker. Let's thank Jorge. Uh, so I've allowed people to unmute themselves, but please mute yourself now unless you ask a question. Um, so are there any questions? Uh, you can either put your hand up or just go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, yes, please go ahead, Zesson.
Hi. Mm. Hi, yes. Uh, so. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you for this, fan fan for this fantastic talk. Uh, just a quick question. So what does this uh, dotted arrows represent? Right. So this means that, uh, that this is a sub-language. So this is a sub ah. Pi is a sub-language of H of pi, and okay, H is a sub-language of, of, of H of pi. OK, I see. Thank you. Any other questions? I see Laria raising her hand. Ah, good. Please go ahead. Although I don't see. I think see. you need to unmute yourself, Ilaria. We can't hear you. Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm sorry, that's that's my fault. Oh, wait. I had the wrong. I, 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 I'm sorry, Laria. That was that was my fault. I think I accidentally clicked the wrong box in the security session. Security protocol. Uh, I think you should be able to unmute yourself now. Uh, yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, um, hot head. I believe all these uh, you presented is for binary sessions, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, because I was a bit confused when at first you said that prefixing in the types exactly corresponds to prefixing in uh, in processes, and because this is won't be true probably in multi-party sessions. And similarly, uh, similarly, when you use the acro acronym MST. Uh, it's the usual acronym for a multi-party session. Yes. So I was a bit confused. No, yeah, I mean, oh. this is this story is for binary session types, yes. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, so the natural question is, uh, have you thought of generalizing this to the multi-party case? And... Uh, well, that's a relevant question. Uh, I should essentially, I could reply by promoting this other line of work in which we have uh, for, for, for different kinds of, uh, of binary session types, we have decomposed the analysis of uh, multi-party sessions using binary sessions. So I okay. think at some point you can reconcile these, mm -hmm. these different lines of work. Uh, you need progress. So progress becomes a, a, a component there, an ingredient that, that is relevant. Mm -hmm. Because if you want to essentially, if you want to decompose multi-party, let's say processes, and then you want to to, to look at them in terms of binary of, of, of performing binary protocols, mm -hmm. you need to make sure that uh, if you have some sort of orchestration between them, this orchestration never gets stuck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So progress doesn't reduce to deadlock, deadlock freedom anymore. I mean, in the multi-party case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So 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 you need uh, you need extra things, but it's a relevant question, right? So. So how I, I think it it it, it holds and uh, yeah, but but we have not explored at least with this kind of 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 design. Um, something I should say is that uh, well we have formalized at some point an extension of this H O pi with multi-party types for the purposes of reversible computing. So we have a formalization multi-party session types with that for for this H O. But uh, we have not uh, we have not connected them. So this at, at, at the moment is kind of independent lines of work in the moment. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? So I, I have a I have a question, Jorge. So you mentioned um, linear logic a few times in your talk, um, but. I'm just wondering, I know that some other people who work on session types sort of emphasize this very close connection to linear logic. Um, of course. Does it play, does it play a role at all in your, in this, in this kind of, in this work that you showed us, or do you have some sort of dialogue with linear logicians? Right. So, well, there is of course a very important line of work on, on giving foundations to session types using linear logic or more precisely using a, a curry how or correspondence between session types and linear logic. So actually, I was quite tempted to talk about my line of work on that. 
because uh, it's quite it's quite it's quite interesting uh, and admits a lot of uh, of discussions. Having said that, linearity plays a role in in in, in session type systems, even if you don't fully uh, take the the Curry Howard path, let's say. So linearity plays a role in, in the way in which you will design your type system. So because you 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 really would like to emphasize these two the separation between the linear phase or the and the shared phase in which the agreements are made and the more linear phase in which things should occur exactly once. So linearity plays a role, not specifically from the point of view of Curry Hauer, but linearity plays a role in, in the design of these type systems. Yes. But the, the, these actual encodings and passing through the, 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 the various sub languages and, and the various um, language extensions, does, does that have some kind of, uh, is there some something in linear logic that, that corresponds to this? Or, or I mean, if, if we go via the Curry Howard uh, sort of principle or, or... Well, uh, if you take, let's say the, the binary session type that come from the Curry Howard correspondence, then you can uh, you can use that as a, as a target language for a higher order language with with abstraction passing in which uh, which will have let's say uh, logical foundation by means of of this encoding so this has been this has been developed this exists so there is a way of of actually looking into this kind of or into this 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 relative expressive result from the point of view of, of the curry hauer correspondence so there is a way of, of looking into that in that way yes Okay, thank you. I thought I saw Chad Nestor having his hand up. Chad, did you want, did you want to ask a question? Uh, sure. I had a sort of follow-up question, but I suspect the answer will be the same as the answer we just got about the Curry Howard correspondence, which is sort of how do you know that what you're building with these process calculi in particular is not sort of a sandcastle that will wash away when the tide comes in? Why this and not something else? Well, I need that. So, uh, well, uh, we're starting. So we're starting from 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 this. Uh, let's say the the line of traditional high order process calculator that I mentioned, which is something that has been has a very long, long history and has a longer, uh, yeah, history of developments and a tradition. So we are not starting from any arbitrary high order process calculus. Oh, but surely the people who started that tradition had a reason to do that and not something else. I mean, yes. we just moved the question. So can I, can I continue answering the question of, of why this specific process calculus or why the... Oh, yeah, sure, sure, sorry. <laughs> so essentially, we are taking rep uh, representative instances from the first order calculus, a session pi calculus, and also representative instances of the higher order process calculus. And we are, we are connecting them in a way that, uh, that uh, this decomposition into first order features and higher order features, it's possible, right? So that said, it's not the only way, of course, of formalizing the phenomenon of, uh, of first order passing and higher order passing in, in, in this sense, and indeed, uh, the, the more recent developments on, on the curry Howard correspondence give another lie to look into that. I wonder if it is answered your question. I think it's a great, really great answer. Uh, are there any are there any other questions? Hi, Pavel. This is Sanjeeva Hi. here. Can oh, Sanjeeva, go ahead, please. Yeah. Uh, hi, Jorge. Nice to hi, see you. Thanks, nice to see you. Thanks for, thanks for a great talk. And I think I'm understanding a little bit more about session types. Uh, a couple of questions. So one uh, is this uh, red line you have between pi and HO. Uh, and you said that this is a tight encoding, which is mediated by types. So, yes. you know, I remember when I was working on my thesis and trying to define higher order by simulations, uh, I needed to make sure that they were logical relations. Uh, is that when you say tight encodings mediated by types, is that what you meant? Uh, no, uh, what I meant is if I can just go to the specific, are my uh, slides visible? Yes. yes. Okay, yes. So let me just go to, 
So this is precisely what I meant. So actually, I just need to show you this. So uh, this is the translation that, that defines the red line that, 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 that was in the, in the previous slide. So actually, the refinement here is very simple. If, if you know already this encoding, the idea is that if you are going to represent the passing of an abstraction and you want to compile this down to a pi calculus or to a session pi calculus, what you need to make sure is whether this the body of the abstraction you're sending contains some linear names. Mm -hmm. If it contains uh, if it contains linear name, then you you will treat it differently as if uh, as it will contain it will then contain linear names, right? The point here is that if it contains linear elements, it cannot be replicated. So the right. refinement here yeah. is very simple. I'm not I'm not claiming any kind of a sophistication here because what you're distinguishing is well, if there are some linear resources involved, you don't want to replicate this. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's what I meant. And of course, when you're going to think about the properties of these mapping, you need types, and we have typed behavior equivalences in order to to to, to enforce the all the invariants that are involved. Okay. So I, I'm sort of thinking back to some of the stuff that you know when you had that bridge between functional programming on the one hand and uh, you know concurrent calculi on the other. I was sort of thinking about some of the design decisions I was making way back in the late '80s. Uh, when working on Facile, which was that rather than go, you know, reduce all the way down to a primitive calculus, whether it was the lambda calculus or whether it was uh, pi calculus didn't exist, it was sort of being invented uh, at various stages. Um, uh, Gerard Boudol had his blue calculus, for example. Uh, one of the things which I had in mind was that you could do a sort of partial um, trade-off between how much of the concurrent calculus you wanted and how much of the lambda calculus you wanted. You could sort of freely float between the two. Uh, and that was one of the things which uh, mediated many of the uh, ideas about compiler optimizations that we had in mind. Um, that was one. And the main trade-off we had when we started talking about distributing code uh, and running it in multiple places was a trade-off between locality. And in fact, the paper I wrote with Roberto uh, Amadio was called Localities and Failure, not Locations and Failures, for a very specific reason. We were trading off locality, which is a generalization of restriction, and linearity, which is a what you can reasonably do in a location. So that was a kind of trade-off we were trying to play with. And I still don't know whether that has been fully uh, explored. And I'd love to, to sort of re-get into this many, many years down the line from when I was doing that. But it's, it's something which I don't know has been fully explored. Uh, and nor do I think the connections with CPS, uh, I mean, Robin Milner's work was of functions as processes quite literally followed CPS, and it was an encoding of certain CPS translations, showing that the, um, you know, you could, you could encode CPS and therefore you could get all this expressive power in the pi calculus itself. But I guess you can go the other way as well and show that in a functional language with continuation passing, you can encode almost all these higher order processes. I mean, we had fully higher order processes in facile higher order pi with functions and so on, mm -hmm. on processes and so on. Uh, we didn't have a very nice type system and so you could sneak in recursion in a rather ugly way because we essentially had a process type which you can think of as false. You could do horrible things. You, you lost normalization. You lost strong normalization. Anyway, uh, you know, this is sort of what came to mind, but great, I mean, it's great to see these coming Back to yeah, exciting. Thanks, Thank you, Sanjeeva. Okay, so I suggest we um, stop the formal part of the seminar. So I'll stop the recording, but Jorge has uh, kindly um, offered to stay for another 30 minutes or so, 20 minutes. So if you want to stay, yeah, 25 minutes is fine. Yes. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop the recording now.